trigger warning. During this show, you may encounter references to Royal Canadian Mounted Police, slut shaming, body shaming, Nazi paraphernalia, ageism, racism, ableism, Chris Brown, bug infestations, homicidal clowns, snakes, spiders, death and dying, blood, scarification, colonialism, people who burst into tears in the sauna, more clowns, whippets, Joseph Conrad, wet feathers, small holes, animals in wigs. Wait, did I just say wet feathers? Like when I'm in the kiddie pool at Danielle Dakota's house and I'm five years old and there's just this one wet feather floating on the surface of the water and it's coming toward me, but I'm frozen in place and I can't move and I know the feather is going to touch me. Ah! Uh, anyway, we hope you enjoyed today's show. And now, oh wait, he's under the desk. You can come out now. There won't be animals in wigs. That was just boilerplate from the legal department. Colin McEnroe. You promise? You promise there won't be animals in wigs? Because she mentioned it. She mentioned it in the trigger warnings. I heard her say that. Animals in wigs. I can't see that. All right. We are going to talk about trigger warnings today, perhaps a little bit more seriously than that. Um, and first of all, let me tell you all about the nose. All about the nose. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll tell you who's here. Uh, author uh, Susan Campbell. When is your uh, Isabella uh, Beach It's Road out. Book? It's out? It's, you can have one. Why don't I have a complimentary copy? I'm going to make you pay <laughs> twice. Am I to pay, pay bust out retail for this? Pretty much more All than right. retail. Uh, author of a, a brand new biography of Isabella Beecher Hooker uh, is uh, Susan Campbell uh, from Trinity College, Luis Figueroa from uh, the world of music uh, in his own domain and the Shinolas and so many other things, Jim Chapdelaine. That's who, who's here with us. A little later in the show, we are going to talk about um, – and it kind of links up a little bit to the first part, sort of. Uh, the, the strange odyssey uh, of a young woman at Duke who has, has been sort of outed as, as uh, a person who's making expenses meet in the difficult world of paying for college by uh, performing in porn. And this turns out to be not an isolated, ca isolated case. There are other people uh, doing that as well. Uh, she's making the argument that it's not only makes practical sense, but uh, it's actually a feminist choice. So we'll talk about that. We'll also talk towards the end about Fred Phelps. You know him from Westboro Baptist Church. Susan wrote about him many times, uh, and uh, he is dead now. And he's not having a funeral, which is sort of ironic because he picketed and led picketing of so many funerals. Uh, but we'll sort of talk about, you know, how, what's the civilized way to bid farewell to Fred Phelps and what kind of uh, place he occupied in our minds. And then towards the end of the show, we'll, of course, have endorsements. But we are going to start out with the topic of trigger warnings. Now, trigger warnings, probably the first trigger warnings came not in any of the context that we're going to mention today. I think they came, remember those 50s monster movies where they gleefully told the audiences that the content of the film they were about to watch could be dangerous if you had hard problems? problems or nervous problems or something like that, maybe you better just run out of the theater right now. But in a more contemporary context, they started out, we think, on blogs, specifically feminist blogs, where, you know, not unreasonably, people were warned, well, you know, if you if 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 any kind of conversation about, say, rape sets you off and be prepared, be aware, uh, that that's going to be in this article. We don't want to trigger anything. It kind of expanded from there. It's moved over into mainstream media. From mainstream media, it's moved over into the world of academia where there are now debates on campuses about whether or not a syllabi uh, should should contain warnings and not just about sort of the typical things. I mean some of the things in the intro uh, are not that far flung. Uh, trigger warnings have been applied to, we are told, topics as diverse as sex, pregnancy, addiction, bullying, suicide, sizeism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, slut shaming, victim blaming, alcohol, blood, insects, small holes, and yes, animals in wigs. So, um, uh, and it's, so the question is, is this going too far? And is it restricting our ability to, to think clearly about things? And uh, it's been proposed, for example, at Rutgers that uh, teaching Mrs. Dalloway should be accompanied by a warning about uh, suicidal tendencies. The Great Gatsby uh, could be a trigger warning, should have a trigger warning for suicide, domestic abuse, graphic violence, et cetera. So, Luis, uh, you were the one who first introduced this to us. Uh, where were your thoughts going as you read about all this? I think you started with an article in The New Republic. <coughs> Yes, um, I had never, I confess that before, a few days ago, I had never heard about trigger warnings. I will explain how I dealt with this in my classes without knowing that there are such a concept as trigger warnings. Um, the, someone posted on Facebook that article in the New Republic, which is an article that is very critical of the concept of trigger warnings mm -hmm. and goes to some length to explain how the concept has expanded and expanded and expanded to the point where it might be losing its effectiveness. Uh, and obviously, the first reaction I had when I read about this um, uh, was an issue of censorship. 
um, you know, who is going to determine whether the use of certain materials or the discussion of certain topics in my classes is appropriate for the teaching and learning goals in the class. I'm very concerned, for example, um, as I was preparing for today, I ran into a reference to the fact that Oberlin College in Ohio published a document, the administration uh, published a document, not only urging faculty to include trigger warnings in the, uh, their syllabi for their courses, but also um, to remove trigger material when it doesn't, quote unquote, directly contribute to the learning goals and to strongly consider also um, to make the trigger, uh, you know, the material that will be trigger warned uh, option in a class. And so that question of interest raises, who determines what it is? Um, now, I'm very sensitive to these things because the classes that I teach, um, I teach Latin American and Caribbean history for the most part, include extensive discussions about slavery, colonialism, uh, rape in the context of slavery, lynchings, um, all kinds of forms of violence, warfare, and so on. And uh, even the use of certain words, uh, like the N-word that I have to explain the origins of and so on. And so what I don't, without knowing about this concept, is always telling the students at the beginning of the class or just the moment before I introduce something, you know, there is some sensitive material here. I'm going to talk about certain things. But I never thought that I had to include it as a policy mm -hmm. in the classes. Um, Susan Campbell, uh, you and I, over the course of our journalism careers, saw kind of um, a coarsening not only of uh, journalism at times, but a coarsening of the back and forth between journalists and readers. And sometimes uh, I felt like uh, for your columns or my columns or our blog posts, there should be a trigger warning on the comment sections uh, concerning <laughs> some of the things that people were saying that sometimes involved even pulling real triggers at us. Um, but in, and so, uh, you know, in some ways, you kind of have to applaud the goal of, of given how coarse <laughs> online in particular debates have become of protecting people a little bit anyway. I agree, and, and I, I think you have to be sensitive. I, I, I think I agree with Louise, though. There's a limit to how much you can prepare people, and, and I don't mean to sound dismissive, but it's almost like how much padding do you need in the box to get through the course of your day? If, if you know you have triggers, there are words that, that make you want to leave the room, then maybe also a suggestion that if you feel at all uncomfortable, you should feel free to leave the room. Um, I don't know how that would work in a college class. <laughs> They'd never come back. But I, I, as I said when we started talking about this, I'm on the fence about this. I think you can, I, I think you can try to make everything too perfect for people, and maybe they should be hearing some of these things. I want to come back to that. Jim, what was your reaction? Well, well, first of all, I thought it was about trigger points, and I thought, great, I'm an expert. I have them all over my back. <laughs> um, secondly, the only trigger warning I need would be on a cooking show that has to do with runny eggs. And other than that, I'm completely cool. Um, but I totally respect somebody who's had a recent experience that they have yet to fully process, some uh, victim molestation or something like that, or somebody with PTSD, um, where they might want a heads up on something that's very sensitive. Beyond that, you know, I teach audio at a college. There isn't a whole lot of really sensitive information in there that's going to trigger something unless I play a song from somebody's childhood that uh, evokes something horrible. But I do think, as with any new construct, it's going to be abused at first and then reined back. But I, th I also think it's interesting that I did post something on Facebook earlier about we'll be talking about this thing and somebody said, oh, looks like somebody didn't realize that being offended by just about everything has its unintended consequences. First Amendment, trash it. Second Amendment, trash it. What's next? And I suppose the Third and Fourth Amendment would be next if you're going sequentially. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm on the fence about it too, but I could see where, yeah, sure, give them a heads up. But in a college, that's sort of an intellectual incubator and – uh, I don't know. The first time I Googled this, it came up under geek feminism. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say that we'd love to hear there's from you about blog, this. There's a wiki. There's a wiki called uh, Geek Feminism Wiki. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're uh, part of this debate or you want to be part of this debate, we'd love to hear from you at 860-275-7266. 860-275-7266. Well, Luis, I mean, the Oberlin thing that you cited is really interesting. My guess is it's a at that level, it's probably pretty confined. I mean, if you're, 
if you're at Oberlin, first of all, you're. <laughs> I mean, it has, it has its own reputation, and it's not surprising that they would be so sensitive as to really be starting to talk about building some walls around some of this information. It's certainly that's the scary area, right? That um, if in fact trigger warnings go further and faculty are being encouraged to simply exclude material that might warrant a trigger warning. Now you have, and, and maybe you have it even before you get to that point, you have a certain uh, a moment where certain kinds of information becomes privileged and certain kinds of information becomes disadvantaged, right? If, it, you know, if my course is full of trigger warnings and it's there in the course catalog and it's there in the syllabus and stuff like that and your course isn't, somehow or other the material that I'm teaching, it's either going to be very attractive to people who want to uh, immerse themselves in lurid uh, and disturbing material or – operate at a, at a disadvantage because it's so loaded up with these red flags. Uh, yeah, and, and um, you know, how I when deals with this, again, I, I, I've been dealing with it all my career. I've been teaching uh, for 24 years and completing my 24th year. So uh, because I know that I deal with genocide from the beginning of the arrival of the Europeans in the Americas, all the way, slavery, all these things, uh, including, you know, the, the death squads in Latin America in the 70s and 80s and so on, I'm always very sensitive. I don't include it in the syllabus. I didn't think that that was necessary. But from the very first week, I said, look, we're going to talk about certain issues here that are very serious. For example, when I introduce the discussion of certain words related to slavery, such as the N-word and other words, I always say before I even write them on the board or say them, I say, look, we're going to have to talk about this. We're adults, and this is the learning process. My concern, however, among other things, is, as I mentioned earlier, the imposition from the top, from the administration, uh, or pressure by students and so on, or certain kinds of policies. But also, for all the things that I read, some people said, well, the students should be allowed to leave the classroom when that topic is discussed. But doesn't that sort of disadvantage the student, too? The student and was talking about that, too. Then you're the person walking out of the class. Yes, but it disadvantages the student that walks out of the class, and people are going to say, oh, that person is trigger warned or whatever. But also, as someone in one of the articles I read online said, it um, affects the ones who stay because the person who went through certain experiences, who can voice certain perspectives on these issues, uh, is not present in the conversation. So I think that the burden should be on the teacher or the professor to create a welcoming space uh, for these discussions. Um, now, I, I would admit the problem, too, is we have to evaluate people on the basis of the materials we, we produce, that we present to them. Uh, we cannot say, okay, this group of students cannot read these articles or these books or watch these films. Or, I mean, it makes it very difficult. I think it's part of the learning process. Let me I just quick, grab a quick call here from Liz, who's driving. I hope she's not. I hope, I hope you're hands free right now, Liz, because I'd have to give you a trigger warning about driving uh, and talking on your cell phone. A well, written I, trigger warning. I'm free, and I actually just pulled over so that I can um, concentrate on speaking with you. Excellent. Now, uh, what have you got to say? I just would like to know, when did the rest of the universe become the boss of me and my sensitivities? I, I'm a grown-ass woman. <laughs> I can take care of myself. I raise children who can take care of their own sensibilities. And like Susan said, you know, how much packing do you need in the box? Put your big girl underwear on and deal with it. All right, there's hey, two hey, underwear is a trigger two, yeah, thing for two me. Two trigger warnings there, absolutely for uh, <laughs> underwear and grown ass women. You just sound like Susan Campbell throwing her voice to me. I'm not, <laughs> go I'm not, It's amazing that you do that without moving your lips. Thank actually, you. um, well, you know, look, let's go backwards. For, I mean, she makes a great point, which is she wants to be in charge, and she feels like she's not in charge if somebody's running around warning and 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 calling and and, and doing all this kind of stuff. Although I think you know you don't have to go that far back in time. And, and I'm looking at you because you also grew up in a different part of the country from me. But, you know, but I'm really old. <laughs> I'm really old. So, hey, hey. <laughs> same age as Jim. So. Um, so I'm old enough to remember I went to a boys' school where um, nobody worried about anybody's sensitivities ever. Right. Um, I had a teacher who was actually a very nice man, but he was a, a fairly old man at that time. He'd been in the Merchant Marine. He was teaching us Latin. 
Uh, sometimes when we, we come ac across a particularly complicated, difficult to fathom Latin idiom, he would use the phrase uh, that includes the word woodpile, despite the fact that there were actually African-American students in the class. He'd so, say this is a real in a wood pile. And, and nobody said anything. No one objected. And, I mean, I, I look back on that with real horror, but I mean, that was a time when nobody's feelings were ever taken account. I don't even account. know this statement. Oh. I don't e oh, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an I'll idiom. It it's up. a very unpleasant yeah. expression for something that's kind of hard to see. Okay. Um, and, you know, but, but it, 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 there was a time, and you don't have to go back that far, where nobody's feelings were ever taken into that's account. That's true, but th there was also a time when, you know, if you had peanut allergies, Good luck to you. Yeah, and I. So this is like the the intellectual peanut allergy. Now, uh, a part of also of this, I'm, I want to kind of shift positions here slightly, is that for the longest of time, like I, I hate to say, because the example that you gave, Colin, is a boys' school and a, a male professor. For the longest of time, uh, it was white men who were doing the teaching or doing the leading in society and so on. And so in that universe, certain topics could be discussed in a particular kind of way. Hey, wait, hey, wait, has, that, has that changed? Well, well, no, no, partially. So once you began to include in, this, in the mix, going to college or in certain situations, women or minorities, racial minorities and so on, certain issues become more complicated. And I'm very aware of that. And so in a class, for example, that I'm teaching now about the African diaspora and Latin America and the Caribbean, I have to be very aware all the time, very sensitive to the fact that of the 16 students, about close to half of them are of you know, white European descent, and then there are some Latino students and some of them of African descent, and there are some students of various locations in the world who are of African descent. So I have to be, be careful how I address the issues. But I do not think that it's a good service to them to uh, exclude certain materials. Now, again, I'm trying to shift slightly here and be like an advocate or another position. Um, this semester in the same class, African diaspora, Latin America, and the Caribbean, I asked the students for the first paper to write um, using the readings and the discussions in class an analysis of two films on slavery. In one of them, uh, a domestic female slave is raped several times by the master. Now I have to uh, you know, take into consideration that who knows if any one of my students have gone through this experience of rape. And that is very sensitive, and I'm very cognizant of this, and I have to be very careful. So I always try to say, okay, we're going to deal with this and so on and so forth. If you want to talk to me privately about whatever issue, yes. But I don't want to be in a situation where an administration is pressuring me to change what I teach. That's my concern. I don't think you can cover animals with wigs. Mm -hmm. I, this is not something that would have come up on a list for me. Well, and I think here's the other thing. Um, you know, Jim mentioned peanut allergies, and I had the same thought. Uh, and I think it's a better world now. I mean, Diane Orson's uh, got a kid who's got severe peanut allergies. She wants people to know that if they're showing up at her house with a bunch of brownies or something. You know, I mean, it, that's good. It's, right, a good right. it's a good thing we have a world where we're, we communicate better about stuff like that sure. than we used to. And it's a good thing we live in a world where I think a teacher wouldn't be comfortable using an expression like that one. But to use another medical analogy... It, it also strikes me a little bit like um, antibacterial soap and antibiotics. You know, if you use that too much, your ability to cope with a normal bacterial environment starts to deteriorate a little bit, right? I mean, the more protected you are, uh, paradoxically, uh, you know, the more vulnerable you are. And, and I wonder about that, too. And I'll, I'm going to frame it, Susan, specifically at you because you and I have, like, uh, have another experience in common. Uh, I was circulating around some links about um, stuff this weekend, including the reopening of the so-called Freedom Tower or the World Trade Center. Um, you were at Ground Zero a lot longer than I was, um, but we were both at Ground Zero during 2001. I wound up with a little – I don't know what, it ha what, what happened with you. I wound up with a little case of PTSD from 9-11. Mm -hmm. And it took me a little while to get over it, too. And I, I really am kind of dreading the reopening, mm -hmm. you know, which will come mm -hmm. this year. And I, it will probably trigger things in me. Although I basically feel like that's kind of my journey and it's going to be yeah. It's going to be whatever it is. I'm just going to have to deal with it. But, you know, I, but I sort of get why somebody – I get the whole idea of a trigger anyway. Sure. But you are aware of your trigger and you also know that you're not going to have them stop construction there because it bothers you. 
it reminds you of some very painful event from 2001. Well, I, I wrote them five letters, and they didn't they seem didn't to be paying answer? attention well, to me. You know. Gosh, it's not fair. Mm-hmm. But you, um, yeah, I, I, I had a hard time for a long time watching the towers come down, and mm-hmm. I would show something in my class and say, where were you? And we talked about the media construct that followed, and I would have to just sort of bite the inside of my face because that that's bothersome. But I can't not show that video in my classes because it bothers me. And I I always talk about, and to Luis's point, I am very aware when I talk in my media class that not everyone came from the same religious background. Not everyone came from the same socioeconomic level. Um, And that makes me more sensitive. But I would never want to tell the students that they also have to let us know about trigger warnings because the conversation will stop and go into a corner and die. Mm -hmm. You you know, there's another medical thing that would would be analogous to this, too, is people who have had uh, certain illnesses have to be periodically retested for those, get scans. We call it scanxiety. (laughs) And and so you can't, you know you that, that that's going to be a trigger for you, but it's in your best interest to go through with this experience. Mm-hmm. So to remove those scans from your future is significantly um, diminishing your prospect of having a future. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, grab a call from MD in West Hartford. Hi, you're on the air. Hi, how you doing? All right. Uh, my question is very simple. Does trigger warnings enable avoidance? Well, I think that's sort of what we're talking about here a little bit. I mean, you know, I think as everybody here is saying, it's it's a balancing act, right? It's it's Pretty much, it's yeah. not one thing or another, and and all of us make sort of trigger warning decisions. Like I still haven't seen Django Unchained because I just hmm. I sort of have weighed the pluses and the minuses. And I've, <laughs> I just don't think I'm going to get enough out of this movie to warrant what I'm pretty sure I know is in the movie. So we do that all the time. And we, we do avoid – why shouldn't we avoid things? Yeah, I delayed watching Two Days a Slave for these reasons. And that doesn't diminish anything by avoiding something like that. What, what, it, what is dangerous is if you avoid a peanut allergy warning or something and you have that allergy. So, yeah. so that somewhere in there is this line. You don't miss anything by not seeing Django Unchained. Well, you miss a horrible revenge fantasy, but uh, you're not putting anything in danger. You're not going to have a sleepless night by missing that. So you've chosen to avoid that for a reason. Whereas I insisted on going to see 12 Years a Slave because I, even though I knew it was going to be hard, I also thought, you know what? I, I just I trust Steve McQueen. I mean, I think Quentin Tarantino is kind of a moron. So um, I thought, why should I subject myself to Quentin Tarantino's weird fantasies and just uh, – based on any kind of lesson I might pull out of it. But I was pretty sure 12 Years a Slave would really inform me. Did you see the um, commentary? It was a conservative commentator, and he was angry because he thought that slavery was presented in too negative a light, <laughs> <laughs> that there weren't any friendly, <laughs> lovable <laughs> slave owners. And Gone with the wind. Was, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, actually, that's Mr. not true Bubbles. because there is one. Um, uh, I, I, I just want to say uh, that there is a distinction, very important, and Jimmy is pointing out, in situations in life that we cannot avoid, like this one that you're talking about, health. Hmm. Um, And we have to cope with them, and we have to grow a certain amount of strength, right? It's going Um, to benefit you to go through that experience. But it's not necessarily something that we look forward to, or or, or when we are going through, it's very painful. I've never been in a situation like yours at all, but I've been very sick for the last month and a half, and I had to get x-rays, and because I was a smoker for three decades, I was very afraid of the results. Sure. So I was in anguish for a week waiting for all the analysis. But that is different because in this context, they're arguing for giving the person the choice of leaving a classroom, for example. But that's the or extreme not take, of yeah. what we're talking about. Or so not reading the readings that were assigned because they're offensive in one way or the other. Right. So if, so if you really wanted to go to college and be a trigger kid, you could avoid everything. You could simply avoid – I find everything offensive and I'd like my degree, please. Well, I, I think – I mean that, that, that that's almost not that far-fetched. I, I do encounter young people these days, not a lot of them, not a whole generation of them. I'm not raining this down on all millennials or anything like that. But there is a little bit – there's a generation of kids who have been sort of taught that, yeah, maybe they're entitled to not really be offended or troubled by a lot of things. Uh, and and we're, we as a generation of parents probably caused that by helicoptering over them and telling them that they wouldn't and have strapping to. them into helmets. Can right. I just say that that one slave owner in 12 
years a slave, was yeah. still a slave owner. Right. So yes. he wasn't a good guy. Yeah, no. okay. yes. 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 Well, a little lemonade doesn't yes. get the curse yes. off. Yes, exactly. Thank That's you. putting a little bit of sugar in it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're going to grab one call from uh, Michael. Then we really have to move on because we have to get to our next segment, which has a trigger warning. Uh, here's uh, Michael in New Haven. Hi. Hi, how are you? Just good. I'm just calling. My son attended a private school in seventh, eighth grade. It was a K-8 school. And when he was in the seventh grade, they read Huckleberry Finn without any sort of preparation kind of thing. He was the only black student in the class of about 12 to 15 students. He came home crying and distraught about the whole thing. So we had to, we didn't know it was happening. So we called the school and we had to arrange all types of meetings to sort of meetings to follow up on how that affected our son, who was the only black child in the class. Mm-hmm. So I, I just wanted your take on, on that. I think that's a perfect example. It's a great example. Yeah, because yeah, I, I was thinking earlier and I dropped it, but I think even people like as ancient as Colin and I, uh, I don't know about you, but when we read Mark Twain, we were prepped for this language and that this was of another time and here we're going to read this classic, but here are the disclaimers for it. And the, the fact that they wouldn't do that now is sort of... Yeah, that, 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 I the, mean, that's the a phrase, word. without any preparation, Michael, is the one that jumped out at us. Susan, what were you going to say? Correct. Just, correct. just that. I, I think that shows a marked lack of, of, of an educational moment on the part of that teacher. What, what was he or she thinking? Right. How could you even approach that book without, without preparing something. whether your son is even black if, or even white? If the, even if the whole class were white students, it's you would still, still have to prepare. Right. That's what yeah. I mean. don't want them repeating yeah. it. So. I mean, it's, it's in many respects an extraordinary book. Uh, not only about everything that it's about, but about that word. I mean, I don't have time right now, but there's one se- segment in the book where I feel like that word is dealt with so brilliantly uh, in terms of the misunderstandings and the projections that people make onto it that, that it is an, it's almost an essential text for understanding American racism and a whole bunch of other things. But boy, to spring it on anybody without And if you're in seventh grade, That's you don't have the right. context for that either. Mm-hmm. And to be and 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 to be the only African American child in the class, that's just yeah, not right. right. That was a boo boo. Uh, that would have yeah. been a, uh, that would have been a good trigger warning. All right, we got to take a, a break. We'll be back. Trigger warning. We will be talking about porn. All right, uh, a young woman who goes to Duke University, and yes, there is a trigger warning here. A young woman who goes to Duke University, she's a, a fresh woman, a freshman, uh, is having a very interesting uh, period of time. She's kind of been outed by another student as uh, uh, as somebody who works in porn, uh, and she's been now writing about it and talking about it. Uh, she goes by the name Belle Knox uh, in her porn life. Uh, she, I don't think she's quite uh, that uh, out about her actual real identity. She's talked about it in a lot of different ways, uh, and she um, absolutely does consider it to be a times a feminist choice. Uh, She also says, I couldn't afford $60,000 in tuition. My family has undergone significant financial burden, and I saw a way to graduate from my dream school, free of debt, doing something I absolutely love, because to be clear, my experience in porn has been nothing but supportive, exciting, thrilling, and empowering. Um, She also says she compares that to uh, having a weighted tables where she was treated like poop. I'm uh, paraphrasing. Uh, so, and, and she she does talk about it. it, and it turns out also the Atlantic magazine uh, found at least two other people doing the same thing, uh, bearing the incredible expense of higher education these days uh, by working in the sex industry, um, having kind of different feelings about it. Although one of them said at the end. Um, uh, she says, my hope is that society will eventually evolve to a place where it can respect and recognize sex workers as the human beings and laborers that we are, minus all the stigma and moralistic judgments. See, so Susan Cable, this this, <laughs> <laughs> oh, crap. this <laughs> well, it kicks up against an interesting tripwire uh, here because it totally I mean, does. you know, because I think the latent assumption, particularly on college campuses these days, is that porn is pretty much at least. People having to work in porn is really bad. You know, it can never be good. It's always degrading. It's exploitive. It puts them on exhibition, usually for the male gaze and the absolute worst state of the male gaze. So it's it's surprising to hear you know a smart and a, a, a woman who believes herself to be self empowered talking about it this way, right? I have read essays like this from time immemorial, and this is where this bumps up against my hairy legged feminism, in that. 
when you when I have talked to certain young women and they talk about being a feminist, although they won't use the word because it's an F word, they'll say feminism is about choice and it allows them to wear push-up bras and skinny little skirts that look like belts. And I'm going, oh, my God. Okay, well, that's your interpretation. In the same way I approach porn, if I approach it at all, it's theoretically, and I'm sorry, I'm really white bread, um, as th nobody wins in this. And, and I'm sure I can hear arguments that won't change my mind but will be beautiful anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we just lower the cost of higher education and everyone get out of porn? Thank you. That's all I have to say. <laughs> well, that was beautiful. That's actually good. Yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. Our, our phone number, by the way, 860-275-7266. You may have to call in because Susan's done talking. 860-275-7266. She's not going to talk again until the Fred Phelps uh, segment I'm here. I'm waiting. So. I, you you know, know, the, the, the sidebar to this is that it turns out her father is a doctor mm -hmm. and apparently was – I don't know if he was overseas. I don't know if he's a military doctor or what – but. It didn't sound like she was financially strapped, and I'm not uh, disparaging her in any way because everything she says and talks about seems well thought out. She seems like a very bright kid, and and I emphasize the word kid mm -hmm. because I, I was curious, curious enough about it that in the interest of research, I went and took a quick look at a clip, and she looks like she's 12, and I was horrified, and it's – it's a uh, it's a whole different world than when I grew up in, and found a Playboy in the woods. This it's not like that anymore. Um, so there's a it's, she's dealing with a pretty harsh dynamic in that world. I think I don't think women are that empowered in that world, and maybe there's this self justification for something. But but I, her story isn't entirely consistent. I would love to hear what a real feminist says. Not that there is grades of feminism, but I would like to hear you, perhaps, and her, <laughs> you wanted to discuss, even though you're I, not talking. I, no, I, I will talk. I would actually enjoy a conversation with her, as I enjoy conversations with younger women who I, don't identify as feminists, but they have all the stripes to them. Um, I don't buy the argument. I'm not saying I'm right. I've just never found you have much power um, Displayed on your back with your nether regions shaved right. for yeah. everyone to see. That doesn't strike and that, me. And that, that brings me to a, an, another little sidebar, and then I'll shut up. But I had an intern uh, several years ago, and uh, I noticed that he was devoid of – he had a beard, but he was completely devoid of any body hair that I was – privy to, and I wasn't privy to all of it. Uh, let me be clear about that. In turn. So where I'm this listening. story goes is I said, what's up with the, the chest why and the hair? Why, why are you like, you have a beard, but you have no hair anywhere? He said, oh, well, the, you know, kids just follow what porn stars do. Huh. So it was the whole social norm, sexual norm for them is dictated by, the porn, by stars? porn stars. I got to uh, get out more. Yes. yes, absolutely. That is a reality um, for quite a few people. Um, uh, I lived in a college campus uh, in a, an apartment for um, faculty in residence that is in a building that is a dorm. And I lived on the busiest street on campus where all the fraternities and the other dorms and so on. So because at that time I uh, was a smoker. I used to sit down with a camping chair outside with my computer because it's wireless at any hour of the day because I'm a night owl. And I heard conversations that, uh, that really shocked me, even though I've been a professor since 1990. Um, and I was not approved as a student in college or graduate school and nor as a college professor. Um, but increasingly for a f quite a some time now, the model of what I call technical sex is supposed to be is drawn more and more from the porn watching experience rather than a normal social interaction um, between people of the same gender. Or so are, we, are we talking sort of about hookup culture, about sort of the notion not that only, it's not only, kind yes, of transactional not, as yeah, opposed to? Well, hookups, there were hookups all the time. I mean, if, well, way back in the day, uh, the hookup culture now is more extensive. Mm -hmm. But it's not only that. It's then if you hook up, what kind of sex do you have? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the models for how you behave? Um, 
And so you, you know, that is something that I, I'm very concerned about young people uh, these days. So now, maybe it's access to that. There's so, it's so the internet. You the internet it. makes it so easy for people to get that their whole notion of what this experience is like I, is I colored think, by perfect bodies and that are hairless, like almost. No, elves. no. I think it's not only the wider access, but I think there is a uh, an important distinction um, that. In previous decades, uh, one of the forms in which porn was accessed by a lot of people, <laughs> um, I have to stay serious here because of the people <laughs> are making faces here <laughs> in the studio. Um, but getting back to my point, I want to, I want to make a point. Now. Some trigger has been pulled uh, here. I'm not yeah, <laughs> is, that, is that, you know, going back for decades, one of the forms in which people fantasize about having sex uh, in porn magazines of different rating was through stories that involve eventually having sex. Porn in, for time immemorial, uh, it's convention, and there are stories about this, I'm not just, so uh, it was wrapped around a certain narrative. I think it's a yeah. delivery man. Yeah, so, man comes to fix so, the, the you know, back in the Back in the 60s and 70s, when it was 60 millimeter or 8 millimeter film, or then video in the 80s, and that is the, the steady, the convention was a narrative that ends up with a sex scene. Mm. At some point, however, in, in the age of the internet, uh, as we turn into the 21st century, um, that notion that you should have certain kind of narrative and characters and story went out of the window. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but and let's, it's now let's, just simply you, know, you, you. I know, think you have to agree that just some of these act. narratives were not the. They no, weren't no, exactly no, no. literature. No, no, no. But, but context is sort of a, a big part yeah. of it. Well, let me just yeah, say, I see what yeah. you're saying. Let me just yeah. say another thing about this, which is obviously there was also there then developed a kind of uh, a subgenre of more woman oriented pornography that was exp- much more storyline based. With and the notion, whether f- fair or otherwise, is that women are are not going to react as well to just purely transactional, basic technical sex that they're going to want to see uh, some kind of emotional context for this. But let me just. I, I can could, I? Can I? Yeah. Are are elves really hairless? Uh, I don't want to lose in that. In porn, I think they are. Elves Thank you. Are. Yeah. P- hairless elves. elves yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't. So. I've never that's seen what, that. That's yeah. my. Trigger. However, orcs very hairy. <laughs> Stop yeah. it. Let me just let me just sort of say one semi semi serious thing. I was looking at all this and I was trying to figure out like how to think about it. And and I, I do think that Luis is right that there have been some generational changes too in terms of how this stuff gets looked well, there, at. And part of that is is the media too, right? The media that it's that it's using to to deliver this, the delivery system. But I guess the other thing I was thinking is like uh, all the jobs that you can have while you're trying to go through college and, you know, Bert is tweeting, well, I'll just take out student loans like normal people. How does that conversation go when she's ready to settle down and marry and have kids? I have no idea. But there are, you know, you can take a lot of really stupid jobs in college if, if you need to. And I, I knew people who sold their plasma. And, yep. You know, I and, that. and, and I people who do that. things that are either exhausting or so stupid. that they can barely, or stupid or dangerous or degrading in some other way. And, and, you know, I guess maybe if you're not invested in sex and sexuality in the way that maybe our generation was or you bring a different set of sensibilities to this question, maybe you look at all the possible jobs that you could do, some of which are either dangerous or stupid or degrading or whatever, and think, well, you know, actually I can handle this. The uh, one thing the article said, though, and, and uh, hairless elves aside, that I, I do agree that sex workers are human and they need to be treated as humans and with respect. It's their ch- their... If it's their choice, that's what I have a hard time yeah. with. Well, she didn't meet those standard over. sort of like father issues and everything. And the other thing that, that needs to be addressed is that the guy who outed her yeah. outed her because he had a, some subscription to have access to whatever she was her. doing and he recognized her. So no one's really getting on that guy's case except one porn producer offered him $10,000 to appear <laughs> In a film. That's a lot oh, of money. A, yeah. Um, all right. So we have to uh, – fascinating and engaging the, this conversation is we have to quickly diverge Without. from it. Uh, just for a few minutes, uh, and speaking <laughs> of people who either are or are not human, uh, Fred Phelps, both a lawyer and a self-styled clergyman, uh, died at the age of 84 this week. Actually, on March 19th, I think it was, he was the pastor of the so-called Westboro Baptist Church. Uh, they became famous uh, for, um, for picketing funerals, uh, sometimes the funerals of people who had really no connection or very limited 
supposed uh, tangential connection to the moral decline of America that they were so concerned about, which especially had seemed to have to do with homosexuality. Um, the person who's here better versed in this than I is Susan Campbell. I mean, you wrote about them a bunch of times, followed some of their I court did. cases and stuff like that. So, I mean, one of the questions, I guess, is, OK, so here, here's that moment when Fred Phelps died. Um, and, and people have to decide whether to take the high road or the low road. Right. And my immediate response was take the low road and pick at his funeral. Um, but you sing Jesus loves you or something like that. But you have all kinds of signs where people aren't having sex with each other and things like that. But um, and so I threw that up on the blog and thought, I'm so funny. And then I got these really fabulous comments on that and on Facebook who said, actually, you know, web. Westboro Baptist Church was neither Baptist nor a church. It was a tax write-off for this family. Every one of them went and got their law degrees. They're just, I've interviewed a couple of them. I've interviewed some of the ones who've broken away. And it's just a sad situation. And they tried to bring pain, but the, the, there were so many people who joined together, banded together to keep them from doing their worst that probably better to ignore them and then people were saying i'm just going to pray for him and i thought i'm not that good a christian i want to pick at his funeral and then he's not going to have one yeah. i'm sad <laughs> well yeah go ahead I, I i i didn't know she was a lawyer i mean oh god yeah he was <laughs> civil rights lawyer very successful took some fabulous cases his really? his daughter shirley who i have talked to she's also a fabulous lawyer that's how they make their money. That kind of blows my mind. Yeah. And I, now I'm yeah. not going to say see. anything would, for the rest of the show. I would show. say that I, I, you know, I barely remember the story of the lawsuit and so on. And, and so I decided, okay, let me do some research about this. And I, you know, I read that this was the Westboro Baptist Church. Now I Google Westboro Baptist Church. And it turns out, trigger warning here for language, that um, the, the, the website is www. God, God hates, hates fags. fags. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, oh, I mean, and then I began to read through it. And on one level, my reaction was, this is as close as it gets to be the Ku Klux Klan for homophobia without burning crosses or lynching people. They did I worse. Was, they did, they did worse. Their burning crosses was I mean, to picket the yes, funerals. Yes, okay, but at least not lynching people as far as I know. Right. Um, and then the next reaction was they have a justification for why they use this label uh, f or name for the website that I wish we had more time to explore because I was fascinated uh, about the scripture that they cite. And I grew up very religiously, very Catholic. I was very involved in the church, and I studied about the Bible quite a bit uh, growing up. And so I went to search all these passages, and the kind of God they emphasize is the extremist version of Calvinist, uh, you know, repression kind of God. And I was appalled by this, really. Well, you know, Susan, I, I wanted to bring up another thing, too, which is, that, I mean, there's sort of two ways to look at a guy like Fred Phelps. One of them is he's sort of a useful bigot. Uh, he, uh, you know, he's, he, each side can kind of point to him in a certain way and make distinctions be between themselves and him. Um, and, and, but in some ways, I guess one of the ways that I find him useful or found him useful is that I almost prefer his out and out hostility towards gays to the people who are antipathetic towards gays and an antipathetic towards the ambitions of gays to live as equals in our society who say, oh, well, I mean, I, I, but I, I don't hate homosexuals. And but they I shouldn't God, get married. Yeah, God, yeah. And God doesn't hate homosexuals either, but he, you know, blah, 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 blah. The Joel Osteen <laughs> types. <laughs> yeah, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, you, you kind of do, really. You picked <laughs> a side, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, I kept hoping that the family would at some point have this huge demonstration and say, psych, it was all street theater, God loves everyone. And then mm -hmm. we could all go, oh, my God, you have... You had us. And yeah. No, but it never happened. All right. We've got to take a little break here. Come back. Have time for endorsements. If I think my life was wasted, then my last days will be rough. But if Westboro pickets, then I'll know I've done enough. Oh, Reverend Phelps. Oh, Reverend Phelps. I'll send you a recording if it helps. There's not much I know for certain, but one thing's well understood. If your church is against it, then it's good. I keep picturing the awkward moment when Fred Phelps meets God and notices his huge Sondheim collection. 
Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me. Our interns are Jane Ashley and Skylar Magnoli. The part of Bill Curry was played by Dirk Diggler. Katie Talarski is our executive producer. Congratulations to our Tweetmaster, Greg Hill, on the birth of his daughter, Georgia Betsy Kyone Hill. For show pages, articles, and photos of the Faith Middleton Show staff, trigger warning, dressed up in Renaissance Fair costumes and smearing each other with butterscotch pudding. Hey, my mom works on that show. Maria, hey, yeah, your mom, Lori Mack, is just one of the best in the business. Can I see the photos? Okay, visit our website, wnpr.org. On Monday, we'll break a few eggs and make a scramble out of the weekend's news. And now, back to Colin. Yes, thanks to Maria Mack, uh, the daughter of Lori Mack, producer on The Faith Middleton Show, who is here today. Both of them were here, uh, and Maria is uh, an angelic figure, very much like her mother. Uh, so thanks for helping us out with the, with the thank yous. All right, time uh, to do some endorsements here. Uh, let's start over with Jim Chapterlain. What have you got for us? Uh, pretty lame. I'm pretty lame with the endorsements this week. But uh, Shine is Monday night at the main pub, 7 o'clock. We'll have you home by 10. And in an attempt to recover from seeing the movie Cloud Atlas... <laughs> um, my friend Chris Collingwood said, "If you read the book, it it will save you. It will, it will you'll get that part of your life back." So uh, I have started reading the book, and it is pretty good so far. Is it good? Okay. Yeah. Recommended by you and Chris Collingwood of Fountains of Wayne. And one of the channel, channel the channel is Jim's great band. He just went speeding past that. Uh, but his great band, where, when, and where are they playing? Uh, this Monday at the main pub, seven in p.m. Manchester, yeah. in Manchester. Yeah, right. we right. just played with the the great Danny Cooch last Friday. What time? Seven p.m. All right. Home by 10 is our motto. <laughs> <laughs> this is Connecticut after all. Susan, what have you got? Uh, two things. One is a shameless self-promotion. Um, I'm endorsing the fabulous new book, this, uh, Tempest Toss, The Spirit of Isabella Beecher, Hooker, soon to be a major motion picture. That's a lie. Um, and Hairless Elves. <laughs> well, where uh, are you doing any readings or appearances? Or I am like everywhere on. you aren't. I'm, yeah. Where I can am. people I'm, find uh, out? Is there a website where people I'm trying to help you manage your career here. Oh, someone should. Yeah. Uh, actually, just show up on Tuesday at noon at Old State House or come to the book launch party at 7 p.m. April 16th at Stowe Center. There will be food and music. So you and Martha Dean are both launching yourselves from the Old State I'm House. I'm going to slap you so hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to hurt. The, the, the Old State House also, I was thinking about this. Uh, I didn't have a chance to mention it in my column. But it was also this is a little bit grim, but is was the place where the gallows were, where witches were, witches were killed, mm -hmm. and uh, Hartford. There were killed. stocks there too. I right? think there were yeah. probably were yeah. stocks. So awesome! Like that. So, I love New England. Anyway, yeah. Louis, what have you got, Louis? Uh, so I got an endorsement here. It's the ninth annual Trinity College Hi International Hip Hop Festival. Ninth annual uh, Trinity College International Hip Hop Festival. This is open and free to the public. Um, there are concerts, performances, workshops, films. Um, Lectures, vendors also, um, the regionals of the DMC, DJ scratching competition uh, and, uh, will be held on Saturday. And this is from the morning of Thursday, uh, April the 3rd, through past midnight, Saturday night, April the 5th. Again, this is the ninth annual uh, Trinity College International Hippo Festival. This brings to campus not only international and national performers, but also people from around the region uh, to participate. It's Thursday, April 3rd to Saturday, April 5th. For more information, please go to either one of these two places, the website trinityhiphop.com, trinityhiphop.com, or the Trinity Hip Hop Festival page on Facebook. Excellent. I want to, before I endorse, uh, I want to quickly um, say, uh, uh, just read a tweet here. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, the death of Fred Phelps, and uh, Larry tweets, in the, words of mobs, uh, in the words of Moms Mabley, they say you shouldn't say nothing about the dead unless it's good. He's dead good. <laughs> uh, it's kind of hard to top that. Uh, I would just quickly recommend the poem uh, Elimination Dance by Michael Andaje. Uh, it's actually Elimin Elimination Dance and Intermission by Michael Andaje. You can find the entirety of it on the web, and it's been set to music and stuff like that. And I just um, – I, I think I'm mentioning it because every time I have to come up with – uh, an intro like the one we had today that sort of mentions a lot of different things. I always think of – I'll go back to it because it's it, – and the, the premise of the poem, let me qu quickly say, is it's based on those dances where, uh, where um, people are asked to sit down if they fit a certain description, anybody wearing blue or something like that, sit down. And, uh, I guess uh, Andachi comes from a uh, – 
culture where, where those dances are done. But his, you know, his uh, suggestions to people who have, those who are allergic to the sea, those who have resisted depravity, men who shave off beards in stages, pausing to take photographs. It's sort of those kinds of things. It's a wonderful, very funny, and very exotic poem. I also want to quickly endorse the actor Walton, Walton Goggins, who's uh, performing right now on the show, Justified. I watch way too much television, but uh, as, as Boyd Crowder is Man. giving a, per, you, you, he is giving a performance. Uh, he is a Boyd. marvelous, marvelous guy, is Boyd. Walton Goggins, uh, check him out. All right, thanks to this wonderful panel. It was a great nose. We'll see you next week. Hey, Fred, welcome to heaven. It's a big gay dance party up here. Finally, you can dance with any guy you want. Good evening, godless sodomites. <laughs> Still making jokes. See, I know you don't hate gay people. That was just a big... Big, fat lie. Right, because what does God hate? God hates toast. Exactly. Levita Kitchen Aid 316. Let's dance. <laughs>